And then the rest of us, if you can track down a Bible, please do get with me in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. There are Bibles and book racks in front of you and the chair in front of you. And if you open up one of those Bibles, you should be able to find Proverbs chapter 4 on page 544 in the Bibles that we have here. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 27. Well, let me go ahead and read the passage. We'll put the verses up on the screen as well behind me. I'll read the passage, then we'll pray, then we will get to work. Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my word. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to, one, to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet, and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Let's pray. Lord, as we've opened your word this morning, we're praying that by your spirit, through your word, you would speak to each and every one of us. We're praying, God, for your wisdom. We're asking that you would help us to become a wise people. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What I'd like to do is show you the structure of the passage. If I were to ask you to look at the passage and see if you noticed anything that was repeated or anything that showed up time and time again throughout this chapter, uh, if I gave you enough time, I think you guys would find this. There are three headings, and they each have a very similar ring to them. They, they kind of say the same thing. And then under each heading, you find... A message and it's like it's almost identical in each of the sections they're different from one another but they're all making the same point so let me show it to you the three headings the first one comes in verse one it says listen my son to a father's instruction okay then scan down you get to verse 10 and it says listen my son accept what i say and then you scan down further you get to verse 20 and you see it again my son pay attention to what I say. So there are three different sections here, and you might go, okay, Cor, came to church this morning and uh, wasn't really interested in the structure of a passage, right? Like, this is boring, so let's get on with it. What's, what's your point? And what I'm trying to say here is that if you look at what the passage is communicating and how it communicates it, it underlines this one idea, and it reiterates it over and over again. And it, here's the point. The point that's, he, that's here in chapter 4 is that we need to get wisdom into our heart. We need to get wisdom deep down into us so it becomes a part of who we are. 
In verse 4, it looks like this. Take hold of my word with all your heart. So in the first section, we're told to grab these things and get them with all of our heart. In the second section, in verse 13, we're told to guard it well. The, the words of instruction, the wisdom, guard it well, for it is your life. And then finally, in the third section, in verse 21, we're told, do not let them, the words of wisdom, do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. So this whole chapter is telling us you need to grab a hold of wisdom and get it within you. You need wisdom to be a part of your very being. You need wisdom in your heart. And if you have it, it tells us in different ways that there are blessings and there are potential folly if we do not have wisdom in our heart. Now, here's the reason why I wanted to show you the structure of the passage. It's, it's like pulling back the curtain and you see the, the man behind the curtain. And, or it's like this. I've got two kids. Sometimes they come home with uh, math assignments. And what does it say right on the math worksheet? Show your work, right? They, the teacher doesn't just want you to produce an answer, even, even if it's correct. The teacher wants you to be able to see, the teacher wants to be able to see that you know how to get the answer. Sometimes in preaching, what I want to do is show my work so that you can kind of look into it and you can look at the passage and go, I see it there. I, I understand how he got there. And in fact, if you were to say that about my preaching, I would not take that as a critique. If you walk away and you go, I don't know, Cor just kind of reads what the Bible says and then explains it. It doesn't seem that significant. That, in my mind, would actually be a compliment because I want to show you the work so that you recognize that what I'm saying is coming from the Bible. I also want to show my work so that you can go away from here and when you open the Bible, you have had it modeled for you how to read and how to look for some of these different things going on within the passage. So the, the structure of the passage becomes the point of the sermon. And what we're trying to say then is the Lord is telling us what we need is wisdom in our heart. So let's look at it now in the three sections. Get wisdom, walk in wisdom, persevere in wisdom. The first one, get wisdom, comes in verses 1 to 9. Wisdom is described like a relationship. Wisdom is, is personified as a woman, and we're told that we should go after her. And it made me think of my wife, and it made me think of Rock Valley College and having her in a class of mine, and, and I'm shy and awkward, and I didn't say a word that whole semester, but I really liked this girl, and so I spent a lot of time, multiple, numerous years, numerous years pursuing her and and so we're told here in chapter four of proverbs wisdom is like a woman that you should be going after let's look at it here it says to love her verse six love her in verse eight it tells us to cherish her in verse eight, uh, eight a little further on it tells us to embrace her and we're told that it could be costly look at verse seven though it costs all you have get it get understanding so we should be going after wisdom like we, a lot of you are married or you have significant others. Think about all of the different things that you did to try to win that significant other. Think about all of the, the willingness that you had in that courtship process to go after this person that you loved and cherished and embraced. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Wisdom is so valuable that it should look like somebody who's in love going after their lover. If you possess wisdom, it has all these benefits. It, it's life. Look at verse 4. Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. If you have wisdom, it results in life. It gives protection and oversight. Look at verse 6. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Having wisdom also results in honor. Look at verse 9 or verse 8 there. It says cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her she will honor you. And finally, it's a reward. Look at verse 9. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. So to have wisdom, to, to obtain wisdom, has all kinds of benefits, including that benefit of the crown, meaning you are victorious in life. If you have this relationship with this woman, if you have wisdom, you have all kinds of benefit. So the point then is, do what you can to get it. 
Do whatever you can to get this thing at all costs. Pay attention and gain understanding. Take hold of my words with all your heart. Verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding. Though it costs all you have, get it. So we're reminded over and over again in this section, wisdom is incredibly valuable. You should pursue it and you should do everything that you can to obtain it. So I was reflecting on it then this week and I was wondering if people were to evaluate our lives, if they were to look into the way that we spent our time and our energy and our money and our efforts, would they come away with the conclusion that we are a people who are desperate to have wisdom? Would people come away with the, with the conclusion that we are people who rightly value wisdom so we're doing everything that we can to obtain it? In other words, is it obvious that we are a people who want this? And notice that the whole book of Proverbs is really pushing us in this direction. Um, it's interesting that there are nine chapters of introduction. Nine chapters where every week, so we're, we're weeks and weeks into this thing now, and we're realizing wisdom's not going to be easy. Like if it were easy, we could do a three-week series and we could just check that one off. But that's not how wisdom works. We have to pursue it. We have to court it. We have to go after it. We have to desire it. And, and we have to be willing at great cost to ourselves, do whatever it takes to have it. And so my question is, are we doing that? Because this passage is telling us, get it. No matter what, get this thing and take it into your heart. The second section then tells us to walk in it. So if you obtain wisdom, you need to now walk your life out in a way that reflects that wisdom. We're told in verses 10 to 19 that wisdom is like a path, that it's like a, a way that you're walking in. And if you have wisdom, you need to walk in that way. In other words, if you have wisdom, it should show up in your ordinary life, that you're walking in the way that is pleasing to God. Verse 11, I instruct you in the way of wisdom, and I lead you along straight paths. It's telling us that wisdom is a, is a way of life. If you have it, it results in blessing. It gives you long life. Verse 10, listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. If you walk in this way, it will result in beauty. It's like the sun rise on a beautiful day, like this morning. It says the path of righteousness is like the morning sun shining ever brighter till the full light of day. It's beautiful in and of itself. So here's what we have to do. We have to hold on to it and keep it close. Verse 13, hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it, for it is your life. This pathway is a good pathway that results in all these different blessings. So we have to be certain that we are walking in it. Uh, my younger brother, Tyler, and my sister-in-law, Emily, when they got married, we went out to Colorado and they got married on the top of a mountain. And the mountain they were married on, there was a, a way to drive a car up there and we could park and all of us got out and the ceremony was beautiful and scenic and just, you know, breathtaking experience. But we were there for multiple days. So not only did we go up that mountain, we also hiked up mountains throughout the rest of the week as well. And don't imagine the Williams clan like it, like outfitted in North Face gear and like we know what we're doing. We're in skate shoes and t-shirts and we're just cruising up the mountain. And uh, if you've ever climbed mountains before, you, you'll figure this out pretty quickly. There are switchbacks. You don't just look at the summit and go, okay, let's go. Uh, you actually take a path, there's a trailhead, and you start out on it, and you start zigzagging your way up the mountain with all these different switchbacks and different things. And sometimes you look up and you go, I think that's our path that we're going to meet up with, but we're going this way, and then it starts to go this way. And so you, it's very tempting. I'll just, I'll just meet up with the path. This is the same thing, and so I'll take this little shortcut, and I'll get to the same path. So we hike up the mountain as I remember it, I think everyone made it, but then we're, we're on the descent now, and two of our friends looked down the hill and they said, there's our path. We're going to take this shortcut. And they took off down the mountain, and the rest of us walked. Melody was there. She's smiling big time right now. The rest of us are walking down the path. We get to the trailhead where we parked the car. They're not there. And all of a sudden, we realized they did not land on the same path. They might be on the opposite side of the mountain range. 
they might be in a place where we cannot find them. And it's not like they have all this gear and they're, you know, equipped to handle themselves in this moment. We're thinking they're in skate shoes and t-shirts, like they're in trouble. And you can't just drive the car around it. They don't put roads through mountains. They make a couple of passes at strategic points. And so we're thinking, what do we do? We just lost two of our people to the mountain. And the story, thankfully, we were able to find them. We split up. A couple of us went back up the trailhead. A couple uh, drove around some state, but we did find these people. But the point that I'm trying to make is this path that the Lord is telling us to stay on and this thing that he's telling us to avoid, and he's telling us, do this because this is life. He's not messing around here. He's not telling us, yeah, this is optional. I know that you can forge your own path and maybe figure this out on your own. He's saying, no, to walk in the way of righteousness is to walk the path that God has intended for you. To depart from it actually puts you in great peril. It puts you in a situation where you might be in deep, deep trouble. And in fact, that's what the rest of this section goes on to describe. It tells us that there are people who have departed from the path and into their own way, and it is awful. Look at verse 14. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Verse 15, avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. And we find out why this is such an important encouragement. It tells us that people who depart from the way of righteousness do evil and they actually get to a point where they are addicted to evil. Look at it in verse 16. This is the language of addiction. They cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep until they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. It's the language of addiction. There is a way to depart from God's right way and to become so in love with doing evil that it manifests in this addictive behavior where people are saying, we're saying here, these people are unable to sleep until they perform some wicked act. And you might think, Cor, how on earth does that happen? How, how does somebody get to that place where they are addicted to doing wrong? Now, um, Got a couple ideas here. I think one of the things that the Bible tells us in other places, we've, we've got this thing called a conscience. Built-in feature God gave each of us. It's intended to be kind of that alarm system where we're going to do something stupid and God goes, oh, hold on, or you should not do that. That's my conscience speaking up and preventing me from, from harming myself. We have a conscience, and the conscience is intended to be a helpful and good instrument. But we can actually do damage to our conscience in two different ways. Uh, On the one hand, we can have an overly sensitive conscience, meaning we can be offended or alarmed by things that aren't actually lined up with what God wants. That's actually a whole different sermon for a different day. But one of the ways that we can do harm to our conscience is we we can callous or sear our conscience, meaning we can start to do something knowing This probably isn't the best idea, but we persist in doing it, and our conscience then becomes calloused and no longer feels what it's supposed to feel. And we can do that to the point where our conscience does not function properly. And I guess what I'm seeing here then is that there are people who have done this enough that not only is their conscience seared, it is so misaligned that it actually longs for wrong. That no longer is it alarming when you're about to make a poor choice. It's actually alarming when you're not making poor choices. That's a scary thing. That's why we have to be careful here because we're not just looking at this path and going, what's the big deal? I'm just going to cut a corner here and meet right back up with it. What's the problem? The truth is when we depart from God's way, we are actually putting ourselves in a situation where we could eventually become addicted to evil. And this is true of many of us. I know we could think of some gross and grievous sins that we think, yeah, people kind of get themselves into those habits, but the truth is the same stuff shows up with the secret sin of resentment and envy and bitterness. And we do these things and we make allowances for them in our own hearts, and before we know it, 
we have days where we cannot go to bed because we have not yet sinned in that way. And, and we sit there le- lying on our pillows just saying, you know, playing things over in our heads of how we think about other people. This is a dangerous thing, and that's why we're being warned about it. Wisdom is something that we need to get, and then it's something that we need to walk in, and we have to be careful because to depart from it lands us in this way of the wicked. So if the way of righteous is beautiful like a sunrise, verse 19 says, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. So we want to be the kind of people who are pursuing wisdom to gain it, walking in that way of wisdom, and staying on the path. The third section then tells us to persevere in wisdom. It tells us that if you get it and you're walking in it, keep after it. Stay on the way of wisdom throughout the duration of your life. Wisdom, again, now let's, let's rehearse some of the features here that show up in each of the sections. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to, wor- to my word. Verse 21, do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Get this word into you and keep it there. Verse 22 tells us there are benefits, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Then we're warned. Here's what happens if you depart from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. And then it tells us this this word of perseverance in verses 25 and 26. It says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Meaning if you're going to be a wise person, what you're doing is you are setting your eyes on the goal. You are fixing your eyes directly ahead on where God wants to take you. One of the exercises we did as a staff recently was the life plan, where what you do is you go through all the different categories of life, you know, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with God, your relationship with the kids, your relationship with coworkers, your relationship with the church. You go through all those categories and you say, you kind of eulogize yourself. 15, 20 years down the line, What do I want those relationships to look like? What do I want those people to say of me? And when you set that goal and you fix your eyes on it, then you start to plan your life accordingly. That's not going to accidentally happen. That's going to be strategic. That's what this is saying. If you're wise, you're not just walking on the path haphazardly, hoping you land where you want to. It's saying you direct your eyes where the Lord is taking you and you fix your eyes there. There might be other things that are attractive or you know, distracting you or trying to pull you away. But you're the kind of person who says, no, God has a calling on my life. He's taking me there. And I am going to resolve to stay on this path with him. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Then it says in verse 26, give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. In other words, keep going. Keep on keeping on because the Lord has a work for you and you have to be steadfast in this. You don't just show up at the trailhead and hope it all goes well, but you persevere in doing the right thing. And then here comes the verse that many of us are familiar with. It's verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Probably heard that before, right? Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. This is reminding us that the heart is the place from which we live. And I'm not talking about the organ. I'm talking about how the Bible describes the heart as the command center of life itself. Everything you do springs from your heart. And so we're told, guard it, that you need to have a system for protecting this thing. Just like in the Old Testament, they would have guards who would stand on post at the treasury of the temple and they would have a key on their, on their shoulder. And their job was to evaluate, should anyone come in or should anything go out? And when you think about your heart, that's the kind of language you ought to have. I do not want to permit things to come into this treasury of my soul that do not belong there. This is a very, very important and valuable thing to me, so I'm not going to allow any old thing access into the courtyard of my heart. Guard your heart. And also, you don't want to bring things out from your heart that are inappropriate or do not belong in in that moment. And so we need to be thinking along these lines. Your heart is that important 
So you should have a strategy for guarding it. You should be certain that you are preventing inappropriate things from entrance into your heart. And here's what it says. It is because everything that you do flows from it. Your heart is the place from which you live. A lot of people mistake Christianity as a set of behaviors, a way to, a way to live life according to God's rules and his instructions. It's, it's way more than that. And a lot of times when we think about how to help people, we often give prescriptions that are behavioral. Do these things. Perform this activity. But the Bible gives us a, a much more comprehensive picture of how Christianity works. It tells us that we live our lives out of our hearts and we need more than just behavior management. Because behavior management does not change the heart. You see, if we have enough incentive, we can do certain things. Like with my kids, I can, if I think creatively enough, I can come up with either a reward or a punishment that will motivate them. It's interesting, though, they're different from each other. So the rewards and the punishments are very different from each other. Reese follows all the rules. If all she needs to know is, what are the rules? And then the threat of her breaking those rules are devastating to her. That's all she needs, and that gets her going. Harrison, not so much. He's very whimsical. He can know all the rules, but he's just kind of freewheeling doing his own thing. So we have to be very creative in thinking through how to incentivize him, how to reward him, the punishments that are appropriate. But listen, regardless of whether or not I can get my kids to do certain things until their hearts change, nothing's different, right? In the absence of the reward or the punishment, what will they do? They will default. They will go back to what their heart tells them to do. So my job as a parent is not just to give them all the instructions and get their behaviors to align. My job as a parent is something supernatural. It's to help them get a heart that longs for the things of God. And honestly, what I've just described is not just the parenting task. That is the Christian agenda. We are not here to try to improve our behavior by simply modifying them and tweaking on them and reevaluating them and adjusting them along the way. We are here, church family, to have our hearts aligned to the things of God. And until that happens, no matter how much we perform in a way that looks right, it will not last. And God, honestly, I don't think is that interested in those things either. What he wants is to give us a new heart, a heart that is full of his wisdom, a heart that is desiring of his will and his way, so that no matter what is happening, we're living out of that reality of who we are the forgiveness that we have in Christ and the new life that we possess because of him. That, my friends, is what true wisdom really is. That's why Proverbs says, guys, above everything else, guard your heart because you live your life through that thing. So friends, this chapter tells us we had better get wisdom living in our heart. We had better take hold of the words of instruction from God himself and get them deep down into who we are so that we can live faithfully by walking in the way of wisdom so that we can persevere with a life, with a lifetime of obedience and faith. But at, but at the very heart of the matter is this reality. We need wisdom inside of us. We need wisdom in the heart. And that is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give us the hope of a new heart. And that's what's available to us right now. So let me pray and we will worship. So let's pray right now. Lord, we want to be wise people. And we acknowledge the task that's in front of us. We, we don't just, we're not going to be wise by just making simple adjustments. What we're asking for is that you would fill us with your spirit and you would give us your wisdom. Give us new hearts that delight in doing things that are pleasing to you. Give us hearts that are eager to do whatever it is that you demand from us because we know that we are a redeemed people who've experienced your grace and your forgiveness and your promises. Make us new creation so that we could walk in the way of wisdom and in a way that's pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.